Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Doing this new Monday edition of the show. Uh, this was a good one. This was a conversation with someone I've been wanting to talk to for some time now. Um, and our relationship with zero books makes things like this a, a lot more easier to the schedule and this is our conversation with longtime writer and activist and leftist and if you want to call him anarchist anarchist uh, Michael Albert and he has a new book out on zero called no bosses which uh, discusses his idea of a participatory now I can say it. If you listen to the show, I'm stumbling all over that word. Participatory. Economics. And I'm a firm believer that you have to have some sort of utopian vision to be fighting for. What does your better world look like? I get it. The world we're in is effed up and there's problems and we can critique said problems. But really... What does your better world look like? And how will it run? A lot of times people don't want to have these conversations. You know, it's easy to say stuff sucks. I say stuff sucks. <laughs> Pascal and I spend hours writing about critiquing the stuff that sucks. But really, what does your better world look like? What is your socialist utopia, your communist utopia, your libertarian utopia? What does it look like? How are we going to get there? So we definitely asked Michael Albert a lot of questions about uh, his socialist paradise. What I thought was interesting, too, I had a conversation with the the people that I'm staying with I'm staying with friends right now in the lovely central coast of California and kind of wanted to pick their brains about what they thought about the concept in general and these are people that are not perpetually online in political discourse so I think the conversation is a little more honest when you're not talking to people that are constantly um scouring the leftist YouTube sphere. So, um, in our conversation, you know, first of all, you have to stop the brain aerobics because <laughs> it's so hard to wrap your mind around what would a workplace look like with no bosses. And I asked this question not just to the people I'm staying with, but, you know, I've been walking around town and, and reading Michael's book and getting into conversations with people. And you'd be surprised how often the first thing people do is kind of look at you like you're crazy. When you try to speak about a world of no bosses, like that's just an asinine, insane idea. But then usually if they're open to it, like my friends are you know you explore the, the process more and the conversation opens up and uh, to me it becomes very interesting illuminating if you will so, and I thought the show was great and the patron after hours of this show went probably a little over two hours and Michael, we just had him telling crazy stories. He was telling us a bunch of stories about him and Chomsky and Chavez. And so if you want to hear his leftist rock star tales, <laughs> become a patron. Patreon.com backslash Bitter Lake Presents. And if you want to be a part of these conversations, comment in real time. Well, the best way to do it is probably YouTube. Or Twitch. Or Facebook. 
but YouTube is the preferable way. YouTube.com backslash this is Revolution Podcast. Also, please check out the Real News Network, our buddy, co-host, friend, the man with the mow mow, Pascal Robert, had an appearance on uh, on the Real News Network with Maximilian Alvarez, discussing Haitian history and contemporary Haitian politics. Also, when you listen to this, check out, I believe it's the... Fred Hampton leftists that we're going on as I record this on Friday, October 8th. We'll be on their show, so go back and check that out. I'm sure it'll be interesting and spicy. Very, very spicy. I don't think I plug the appearances enough. Especially someone like Pascal, who does all these goddamn shows. Also, check out the Black News Network. I think Pascal's on like twice on the Black News Network. So this is our episode with Michael Albert, where we discuss his theory of participatory economics. Also, what I found interesting, there still is property ownership in this utopian vision. That sound is my cue. Thank you, guys. And I am out. everyone and welcome to another episode of this is revolution podcast i am your host jason miles and without any further ado let me bring in my homie my dog he's not just my co-host he's a good friend he is he's the mouth mouth man pascal robert Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. By the way, just for the audience, if you don't know, I recently dropped today a video I did on the Real News Network. More information on Haiti. It's on my Twitter feed. You can check it out at P-R-O-B-E-R-T-06 or check it out at the Real News. Jason, I hope you're not mad at me for doing a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, Never. Because as most people know, or maybe don't know, I pimp Pascal out to left media. (laughs) Uh, 
I don't know if I totally disagree with that. <laughs> if there's... I don't know how I, f- I don't know how I feel about it, but I don't know. I totally disagree with it. In in the pimp game, we call it a manager. I'm like a manager. Yeah, they call it a lot of other things in the pimp game too. <laughs> I'd look at Pascal in the morning in uh, in the front seat of my 86 Buick, and i say, all right, Pascal, we have to make this money. So go out and be entertaining on the real news. That's not what happens, but it is a funny picture, though. And then I talk like Terrence Howard in uh, Hustle and Flow. That's that was not a good movie to that, me. That vision of Terrence Howard. Uh, this shirt that people are talking about is from our guest next week, Abby Martin. It's an Empire Files shirt. So next week we'll be talking to Abby Martin about Empire. But today, I think this conversation is very relevant that we're going to have today. Very important conversation. I was actually really stoked when Gene Bajlan had asked if we wanted to get Michael Albert on the show. First of all, there's a lot of zero books writers that I had wanted to get. And, and I didn't get a chance to say this off air because I want to say it on there. Cause I want uh, Michael Albert to know I'm very, very interested in his work. I think it brings up a conversation that we don't have a lot because there's so much time taken up with critique. And deconstruction. And deconstruction, right? If you, if you read my paper, the culture of deconstruction, right? And you need to have, I think, you need to have some sort of utopian vision to fight for. Because as our guest said off here, I want to win. So I made a video intro for today using uh, a 1948 propaganda film, very pro-capitalist propaganda film. Um that is going to tell you about the wonders of capitalism. So before we bring our guest in, let's, uh, let's play the intro. Things to many go. To a 17-year-old kid, it's the malt shop on the corner. Grandpa, it's the front porch in the cool of the evening. <laughs> to mother and her family, it's church on Sunday morning. And to dad, it's his favorite relaxation. <laughs> it's the Cracker Barrel philosophers in Crabtree Corners. And it's the tycoons in Wall Street. It's all races, creeds, and religions. It's freedom to work at the job you like. Freedom of speech and to peaceably assemble. Freedom to own property. Security from unlawful search or seizure. Where's your warrant, Flatfoot? The right to a speedy and public trial. Protection against cruel punishments and excessive fines. The right to vote and to worship God in your own way. It is these freedoms that have made America strong. Perhaps one of the greatest paradoxes of the modern era is that while capitalism is in perpetual crisis, there seems to be no alternative. Once upon a time, Soviet-style central planning at least attempted to present an alternative paradigm. However, with the USSR gone and China embracing its own brand of state-led capitalist development, the prospects of a post-capitalist mode of an economic organization appear more distant than ever. As discontent grows, both liberals and conservatives scramble for answers within the existing frameworks to questions of economic inequality, social alienation, and environmental crisis. But are there alternatives? Is it possible to organize the economy differently? And is it possible to have a world without bosses? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. Okay, okay, 
so we got our freedom. But management's lousing up everything. Labor is at fault. It's ruining the country. My constituents, as your elected representative, I can assure you labor's right. Management's right. I'm strictly neutral. Labor, management, politicians, fooey. Oh, they can't tell corn from oats. Why? It's all right. Take the money out of the house. Help me, help me, help me. Step right up, folks. Here's the answer to your problems. Dr. Utopia's sensational new discovery isn't. Ism will cure any ailment of the body politic. It's terrific. It's tremendous. Once you swallow the contents of this bottle, you'll have the bountiful benefit of higher wages, shorter hours, and security. Enormous profits. No strikes. Remember, you're the big boss. Government control. No worry about votes. Name your own salary. Bigger crops. Lower costs. Why, Ism even makes the weather perfect every day. And now then, because we are introducing this amazing item for the first time in this country, it isn't going to cost you one cent. All you have to do is sign this little scrap of paper, and you get your bottle absolutely free. I hereby turn over to ISM Incorporated everything I have, including my freedom, and the freedom of my children, and my children's children, in return for which, said ism promises to take care of me forever. Pascal. Jason. Uh, how'd you feel about when you when you heard uh, how horrible that the ism was, which is what you know is communism, right? A lot of other isms. I, first of all, you know, the I capitalism, but they weren't talking about that ism. You're looking kind of dark right now, Jason. Uh, I mean, I've been out in the sun, and I, mean, I thought I mean, there's no colorism. I mean, dark in that your screen is black to me. I think you're doing a racism. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say the pun that you know you were looking, you know, more melanated. It's just that I can't see your face because your because of the shadow. Is- it's all your screen is literally all black. I don't know if it's just me or is the whole audience, but I can't see anything. But they now you're back. Now you're back. That's just your screen because I didn't do I did nothing. You didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Maybe, maybe you're so progressive, you can't see color, therefore you can't see coloreds. Oh. That's probably what it must have been. <laughs> but, Let's bring it before he hangs up the call. <laughs> Michael Albert is an organizer, publisher, teacher, and author of over 20 books and hundreds of articles. He co-founded South End Press, Z Magazine, the Z Media Institute, ZNet, and various other projects and works full-time for Z Communications. First and foremost, let's find out what the fuck the deal is with the goddamn Z. He's going to have to tell us. Unless his middle name is like Zebulon. He is the man who wrote the book that we're talking about right now. Out on Zero Books. The Michael Albert. Shit. Extra long applause because I fucked up. (laughs) Hello. Yes, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. What is what is he? Uh, It comes from, maybe you remember the movie Z, Costa Gavras. It's from Greece. Watch it for movie night. It's from, (laughs) it was a long time ago. It's from Greece. Mm -hmm. The Z, the letter Z was like a, not like Zorro. Um, although some people think that's what it's from. It was in Greece. It sort of represented a statement of resistance uh, against the repression that they they endured. And uh, we took it over from the movie, from that. Now I have a podcast that's called Revolution Z, one word. So you're right. The Z keeps popping up. Well, now, well, now we know where it comes from. Yeah. So. 
Pascal, I think you have some 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 questions. I do, Michael. I really appreciate you taking the opportunity to come on our show and reading your book. I really uh, it caused a lot of thoughts to come in my mind in terms of you know uh, the value of providing a model of kind of what a post capitalist kind of world could look like. But what I'd like you to do, if you can give the opportunity to our audience, is that you could define or explain what your basic economic or social model, if you will, of participatory economics is as a model and how it works. And then we'll kind of go from there and see, to, to explain how we can get there. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of ground to cover. I'll try and keep it short and then you can ask me questions if you if you want to pursue any further. Sure. Uh, the, the, the vision called participatory economics is not really all that much, and it isn't rocket science. It's um, we want self-management. We want equitable relations. We want to have solidarity among. We have, we have certain values that we we appreciate that we desire to implement. And right off the bat, you sort of notice, and this will chart. I'll, I'll do it in a way that sort of charts the thinking about it when it was developed. Um, if you want these kinds of results, you obviously can't have a small set of people who own all the workplaces and who control them. That violates people controlling their own lives. It, the accumulation that they do uh, violates any degree of equity and so on. So very early in the process, and we won't spend any time on it, you, you have to reject having private ownership of the means of production. But if you do that, you now have a problem. Okay, who makes the decisions in the workplace? Who runs the workplace? Well, if you want self-management, which I do, that's a value I believe in. And the idea there is that people should have a say over their own lives, uh, a say over decisions in proportion to the extent they're affected by them. Well, then clearly the workers need some vehicle to, to develop their views and express them and manifest them. That's called the workers' council. Uh, consumers have consumers council and uh, you know, use self-managed decision making. Okay, so now we have two components of this vision arrived at, obviously, very briefly and succinctly, but still. And now we come up with another problem. Well, if workers are going to make the decisions in the factory, what is it or in the workplace what is it that permits them to do that? What is it that uh, gives them the information to do that, that gives them the confidence to do that, that has them empowered to do that? And if you look at uh, American workplaces, uh, and if you look at the old Soviet workplaces also, you see a division of labor uh, that is similar pretty much across the board. And that division of labor is that Roughly 20% of the employees, of the people who work in a workplace, do all the empowering work. They do the tasks which, by virtue of doing them, make you feel confident, give you some information that's relevant to making decisions, give you connections to other people that's relevant to making decisions, put you in touch with the levers of decision-making. And 80% do essentially rote, tedious tasks, which in fact do the opposite. They disempower you. And so if you have that situation, even if you have a workers' council, and even if in the workers' council you have uh, democratic and even beyond democratic self-managing uh, decision-making mechanisms, which we need to talk about, but anyway, even if you have that, if you have 20% ready to decide and 80% not the 20% will dominate the 80%. So the next component of an economic vision that's going to get rid of class division, that's going to get rid of that kind of, of material and power hierarchy, is, I think, or should be, I think, uh, what we call balanced job complexes. And that just means that at work, in your economic life, the circumstances that you experience, that you and act with every day are comparably empowering to the circumstances that everybody else deals with each day, interacts with. So you don't have the circumstances of economic daily life in workplaces 
elevating 20% over 80%, over 80%. You don't have that new class division <clears throat> so that a new boss takes the place of the old boss, out with the old boss, in with the new boss. Uh, so then the next thing to, can be, to focus on, I think, is income. What share of the social product do we each get? That's what income is. Income is a claim on the social product, right? It, it determines how much you can have back out of what society produces. And there are various uh, um, uh, norms for income. One is that you get income from property. Well, we just got rid of private ownership, so that's not an issue. And there goes profit is gone. Another is that you get income for your power. If you have more bargaining power and can take more income, you get more income. It, essentially, it's a kind of a thug's uh, standard for, for how people should be remunerated. They should get it because they have more power. Um, actually, as a little sidebar, Al Capone, the famous uh, uh, criminal uh, in the United States history, was once asked in an interview, uh, how do you think about the United States? And he said, I love the United States because in the United States, you get what you can take. It's an Al Capone-ish approach to economic life. And that's the way markets work. In any case, if you don't want that and you don't want income for property, what about for output? Well, we don't think that's right either. Although a lot of people calling themselves socialists who believe in, in what they see as socialism do think it makes sense to remunerate output. So in other words, you would get back for or in, in accord with the amount you contribute to the social product. Um, but we don't think that makes sense because it rewards having better equipment. It rewards happening to produce something that's more valued. It rewards luck in the genetic lottery. If you're born like, like LeBron James, you make more if you reward output. We don't think that's right. We don't think you should be on top of luck in the genetic lottery. You should be, you know, have wealth poured upon you. We think you should get income for how long you work, how hard you work, and for the onerousness of the conditions under which you work, which is about as opposite as you can get from what we have. And finally, how do you connect all this stuff together? Well, the economists tell us you have to use markets or you have to use central planning or maybe a combination. We reject both. We, we think both reintroduce class division. We think both distort personalities. We think both violate self-management and so on. So we propose an alternative, which is called participatory planning. And that's really, uh, without going into detail for, about each component, but that's really what, it, what this vision is. It's just a few defining features, which we think are essential if future people are going to control their own lives in an equitable, solidaritous context. And, and how does beyond that, those features, future people decide for themselves. And that's the picture. And how, and how does participatory, participatory, I can't talk, <laughs> participatory planning differ from central planning? Well, in central planning, the, the situation is roughly this. You have central planners and central planners send a set of, of possibilities, proposals, let's call them, to workplaces. And in workplaces, you have people who the central planners communicate with. That's that corporate division of labor, managers, engineers, lawyers, financial officers. And the workplace says back to the central planners, here's why we can do it, what you're suggesting, or here's why we can't do what you're suggesting. So there's a little bit of a dialogue between the central planners and the workplace. So down goes some information. I mean, yeah, up comes some reaction. Down goes some information. Up comes some reaction. Down goes orders. Up comes obedience. At no time is the, are the, are the workers in the factories, and for that matter, the consumers in neighborhoods, participating in and, in fact, governing defining the decision-making process and arriving at what they want. Participatory economics is quite different. There is no center. There is no top. There is a process of interaction, yes, between 
uh, workers' councils, consumer councils, some agencies to facilitate the process in which a sort of a cooperative negotiation arrives at a plan. So a, plaza, a plan isn't arrived at by an instruction from a top. It's arrived at by a negotiation among all participants, hopefully with self-managing say. So in other words, each is impacting outcomes in proportion as they're affected by them. Now, the details of it, of course, involve much more than that, but that's the logic of it. And so uh, participatory planning is, is consistent with, and not even just consistent with, it facilitates and propels the kind of equity and self-management and classlessness we want. In contrast, markets and central planning are not only not consistent with those things, they propel the opposite. They propel, well, what we see all around us. Mike, Michael, uh, the question I have is that how do you deal with the normal, I would call them somewhat pedestrian question that you would get from people who are products of capitalist realism? Sure. When in that, number one, I'm sure you've heard this before from your critics. <laughs> how do you incentivize innovation? Number two, how do you compensate for skill or specialization? Number three, the notion of having a society without a hierarchy is impossible. Even in primitive societies, there have always been hierarchy. Number four, how do you deal with the fact of state or power or capital resistance to even beginning to implement these policies? Now, I'm not going to expect you to, but I'm- Why don't you I'm, ask them one at a time? It's fine with me. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, my point is that I'm sure that you've heard these questions before, yes. and I'm sure you have answers for them, but- can you explain how we make how we get proof of concept ah. for your paradigm? And okay, that's fair way. enough, right? Um, Please continue. Yeah, uh, that's fair. So, in other words, people have these doubts, which is true, and I come along, and some other people come along, and they say, "Ah, oh, look, the you know, here's why this thing would work. Here's why this thing would be both worthy and." efficient and effective, and they say, back, prove it. Uh, I'm not convinced. And that's fair. And, and you can't prove it in this case by uh, pointing to a whole society which is already functioning in this manner. So that's a problem. Uh, and that's a problem that we have. And uh, it, I mean, it's often true in a lot of domains, but we'll stick to this one for the moment. So what do you do? Well, the best you can do is to try and make a compelling argument, try and provide evidence uh, short of the whole alternative that the argument is valid. So one way to do that is they say they call it plant the seeds of the future and the present. Create institutions, and it's very hard because you're doing it in a in a sea of horrible relations, but create institutions that embody some of these elements and features and that demonstrate their viability. Uh, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to form movements which, uh, um, again, incorporate the kinds of values and structures and to give the experience with doing it. I mean, it's always a problem to to make a case for something that is new and dramatically different, right? Which is what we're talking about here. It's not a little twist on what we have, um, but that's what you can do. You, 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 you can do those things. Now there's a factor that propels it, which is honestly, anybody with their eyes open should know by this time that we are inhabiting a suicide machine. It isn't even just that it's unjust, which would, for me be enough. It isn't just that it's racist and sexist and it has class division and it, it impoverishes and robs dignity, all of which would be for me and was for me when we first developed this kind of vision, which is a long time ago, right? It was enough to propel me to feel the need to have vision in order to overcome cynicism and in order to, uh, you know, provide guidance to our choices, et cetera, et cetera. But nowadays, there's an additional feature, 
which is that without changing the system, and I hate apocalyptic formulations, and I've avoided them for decades, but the reality is that now they're real. Without uh, replacing the system with something very substantially different, which has different implications, we're literally doomed. Uh, it literally is a suicide machine. So, uh, so we have to simultaneously solve two problems. What's the scaffolding, the key structures of an alternative future? We have to fight against current relations and for uh, toward that future. And in the practice of doing that, we have to gain experience and insights into more details about what it is we're seeking. And there's really no alternative to this. If, if we don't do it, it's just beyond comprehension how abysmal things would be. Um, if we do do it, can I prove to you that we can win such a new world? No, I don't. I mean, logically, I can't prove. I can make a strong case. And in practice, we can begin to see the, the, the results. Um now we, we we have a super chat question up and it and it's something okay. that we're going to get to uh on the show um which is asking the question about the environment so the the super chat question that says x well before i read that you know in your book you say uh in your first chapter uh, a value for environmental relations do we favor exploiting and despoiling our environment at the expense of future generations or do we favor accounting for the impact of our actions on our surroundings, taking into account our own well-being, but also the well-being of our children, our children's children, and thereafter? So the question is, Exxon becomes a participatory workplace. What incentive is there for Exxon as a democracy to stop digging fossil fuels out of the ground? So I don't know if you've gotten asked this question before. Okay, so so... The, the use of the word Exxon in here makes it a little bit complicated because I don't want to confuse anything. Exxon has no incentive whatsoever in the current system to pay the slightest bit of attention to ecological impact unless movements are forcing it to. Mm -hmm. The intrinsic dynamics of the system are such that Exxon, incredibly, it has, has pressure from its institutional relations to do stuff that threatens the survival of humanity. There's a fascinating recent result that insurance companies, this is a sidebar, but it's really just come out. Insurance companies, you would think insurance companies would have a high incentive to be for, let's call it a Green New Deal, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily participatory economics, but a Green New Deal at least, because they're paying out billions and billions to claims that are created by the the climate change and the and the damage to the ecology it turns out incredibly that insurance companies are not for a green new deal and that they are among the largest investors in fossil fuels that insurance companies are literally doing that and the reason is because insure i don't know how i got off on this but anyway the reason is because insurance is a is a kind of a gamble the insurance company sells you a policy, Jason, mm -hmm. and they're what are they doing? They're betting that when you pay them for the policy, will exceed what they pay out for anything that happens to you. Mm -hmm. And the return on their investments needs to go up as climate change is increasing the payouts, which it is. So it turns out that they have to increase their short run return. And the short run return on fossil fuels is still high. And so they literally are investing in the phenomenon that is undercutting them in the long run, which is a sort of a microcosm of corporate capital investing in all kinds of operations which are threatening survival. Anyway, back to the real question. So if the, if the question meant if we, if we had a participatory economy, Mm -hmm. And we have a company that's providing, uh, let's say, or that's providing energy. Um, mm -hmm. What prevents them or what causes them to have no incentive 
to pursue, let's say, fossil fuels or any kind of, you know, a violation of the things we hold dear. What what conso- what causes that? Well, the the dynamic is has a, a number of steps, but the key thing to realize is that income is for duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued labor. In the participatory planning system, pollution is not socially mm-hmm. valued. Violating the ecology is oh. not socially valued. You don't get income for doing that. And so there's no material incentive to do that. There is a material incentive to work hard or to work long or to work under onerous conditions if they exist, If you, depending upon how much income you want, depending upon how much stuff you want. But you can't get income for doing stuff with the, which the planning system does not uh, value. And the planning system in participatory economics actually accounts for ecological impact. It accounts for the impact on people's lives, on people's consciousness, and so on and so forth. And so this stuff isn't valued. So there's no such thing as a firm that has an incentive in a participatory economy, right? Not now. In a participatory economy, there's no such thing as a firm that has an incentive or even a means, a path by which it can aggrandize itself at the expense of everyone else. It's just, it's not, the the economy doesn't include that. Why in hell aren't thousand watching us? What? Oh, I, I I'm seeing oh, messages. Yeah, you can't, you can't read the chat. It's it's a it's a dangerous rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> it's a dangerous rabbit hole. Okay, I'll agree. No, no, they, they they were saying they were saying there should be more people. It was a compliment to you. They think more people should be watching this because you are dropping uh, jewels, as the young people say. Doesn't does what you do uh, get recorded and and then become a a. A, yeah. a video that people can. All right, so then people can watch it whenever they want. Yeah, we should have more people in here, like watching live time, so they can ask their questions. Because I hate yeah. when people have fucked up questions after the fact. So the question I have about the participatory economic model is that you're talking about the planning board, and the planning board just determines what is the particular value for income. Is that incorrect? No, there is no planning board. There are workers' councils. Okay. okay. There are consumers councils. And here's sort of a, 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 a schematic of the process. All right. Um, look, in markets, there's buyers and sellers, and they each try to fleece each other. <laughs> in central planning, there's a central planning board, at, which is, which is uh, what I call a coordinator class. It's empowered workers. There are some empowered workers in workplaces who they relate to. And basically, they're directing the economy in such a way as to aggrandize themselves. But to in certain instances of it, it will be better than capitalism in some respects. In certain instances, it might even be worse in certain in some respects. In participatory planning, there are workers' councils. That's the workforce in a workplace. That's what it is. There And they have balanced jobs. So you don't have, there's not a hierarchy, a class hierarchy among them. There are consumers who live in communities. What there is, is a process by which workers basically express what they are capable of and want to produce. Consumers express what they want to consume in light of their anticipated income, which is determined by, for those who can work, the work that they do over in the economy. So you have production being proposed and consumption being proposed. If they don't match, that's not good, right? So you can't just willy-nilly say, we want to produce this, we want to consume that, and we'll ignore the relation between them. So mm. participatory planning has to permit the ex- the desires, the expressions of the workers, and the desires, the expressions of the consumers, to be media- to, to appear to learn of each other, and to do what to refine their proposals in light of what the others are proposing. 
And so you get a, a process which goes on. It goes through what are called iterations, basically rounds of, call it negotiation, until you arrive close enough to what's proposed, meeting what's desired, to enact the plan. But there's no center and there's no central planners. And there's no class division. And now it takes time to make a case, and you shouldn't believe it based on what I just said, <laughs> it, but it takes time to make a case, and the book makes a case, no, bo you know, no bosses, makes a case that I hope is compelling for why this not only gets a plan, but unlike central planning, gets a plan which meets people's needs, generates solidarity, allows people to control their own lives, and is equitable. Now, how does your society of participatory economics, and please excuse me as I stumble over that word, um, take ownership of property, personal and like residences, into effect? Saying that there's no private ownership is not saying that you don't own your shirt or your violin, or whatever it is. In other words, you you are you you get income, and when you get income, you you use it to take to get a share of the social product, violins, mm -hmm. food, all sorts of things. Right, that stuff's yours. Right, what you can't own is the means of production. You can't own Amazon and become Bezos. You can't, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, so that's ruled out. The other is, of course, totally fine and part of life. And there's no way around that, and nor should there be a way around that. So the question I would ask is that you, you said they are consumers and we have the income from the workers. Do, does the reality of trade or commerce exist in the society? And if it does, how do you have trade or commerce without having a hierarchy of value that is normally ascribed to profit without a market? Okay, there's no market, right? There, But I'm not sure I understand your question. So if I mess it up, tell me. Um, commerce, what does that mean? Trade, what does that mean? Every economy no matter what, unless everybody is off in the, in the forest fending for themselves and not exchanging anything, right? Every economy has exchange, and so does participatory economics. Exchange and central planning is governed, allocated, it, it's called allocation, it is uh, determined by the central planning. In markets, it's determined by a competitive uh, interaction between buyers and sellers, right? In uh, and you can imagine, you know, once upon a time they were small producers and and small consumers. But nowadays, of course, the producers can be humongous, and the and the consumers essentially the same as they've always been. People living in households. In participatory planning, there's still exchange. The workplaces as a whole are creating, let's call it a giant pie, the social product, right? Mm -hmm. The income that people have, and if you can't work, your income is simply the, the, you know, the average of anybody in the society, plus, of course, all your health needs, et cetera. So a, a UBI, if you will. That's well, but, uh, but uh, you can have that if you want to, mm -hmm. but- no, what I'm saying is, is if you can't work, it's not a, a basic income, it's a full income. In other words, if you mm. can't, if you can't, society creates this gigantic pie. Yes. The planning process, the participatory planning process is what generates the values that you were asking about, mm -hmm. right? The relative desires with which people want those different things and the stuff that goes into them. So there's, there are prices, there are costs attached to things. And with my income or with your income, you, you get stuff from the social product. The, the, uh, the income for somebody who can't work or who's too young or too old to work uh, is full. It's just a full income. 
Of course, everybody's health care is taken care of, et cetera. I mean, you can even do that, and we should do that, even in our current society. And and would housing also be something that would be taken care of? Housing housing turns out to be complicated, actually. Um, partly because you can pass it on, et cetera. But the question you're asking is, would housing be taken care of? Well, everybody is getting an income. Why would one person get more and one person get less? Yes. The only reason you'd get, you won't get less because you can't work. Then you get the full average income, right? Mm -hmm. So that's out. If you do work, you might get less because you choose to work fewer hours. And in your workplace, it's okay to set that up. And so you set that up. Why would you do that? Because you want more leisure time. You'd rather have the leisure time than the extra income of working during that time. So, and what what about if you want more? Suppose you, you know, I don't know, you, you, uh, you're you a fan of astronomy and you want a, uh, a, a telescope in your backyard and you really want it. And so you want to work overtime. You want to work a lot more more duration because you want that you don't care much about the about the leisure you want the damn telescope okay so you want to work more but the point is the differences between income first of all they're equitable right you 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 get more not because you can take it not because you were born lucky not because you have property but because you work longer or harder right or under worse conditions and and housing is taken care of because everybody has this. If if anybody can't afford housing, nobody can afford it, right? In other words, income mm -hmm. is such. So what determines that? Well, the total social product has to include housing. Well, right? so let me just get, I want to make sure that uh, I'm on the same page with you. So there is land ownership then. It, that <laughs> you're asking what turns out to be, and you are the first person in not only in a podcast, but even among critics, right? Mm -hmm. Who has 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 opened the door to what is arguably the most difficult thing to handle. Well, so, I, I asked, congratulations I asked the for that. Well, um, I asked. Look, this is what I did. I, I'm, I'm staying. I'm staying with some very good friends that are that are letting me stay here in the central coast of of beautiful okay. California most beautiful part of the state. And I went downstairs and I, and I have your, I have your book on my, my iPad and I've been walking around Pismo beach area, fucking reading this shit at coffee shops right, and <laughs> yeah. trying to get into conversations with people. So I went to the people I'm staying with and I started asking about imagining a world with no bosses. And whenever I bring this up, you can see, even when I'm thinking about it as I'm reading the book, my brain is doing flips. Good. Because much like the clip that I made from 1948, that's the world I understand. I may not agree with it, but it's the world I understand. I know. And I can't really understand anything that egalitarian because I know how the bad works. And the first question people usually have is, in the workplace situation is, well, what about the shitty guy at the job that doesn't do anything? Because mm -hmm. we all have a shitty guy, whatever you do. And, and my response to them was like, well, if you control your work environment, you now have the power to have a say so in said shitty guy opposed to you feeling shit on by said shitty guy. Right. And that would kind of change the conversation a little bit. But then property ownership always came up. And if there is no property ownership, people's next question is like, what if the roving horde comes and takes my property? Because that's what people do. And I'm like, well, if everybody has enough, why would you want more? And then it's like, well, people just want more. I was like, well, you want more because you don't have anything. It's it's not a system. Let me address two things. These are all really good questions. So first off, but um, the the observation that you let off with is true, I think. That is what makes it difficult to think about an alternative vision, let's call it, for economics or for culture and for community relations mm -hmm. or for gender and kinship and family life or for political relations. What makes these things difficult is not like what makes 
quantum mechanics difficult or biochemistry difficult. It's not that the actual content is that complicated and difficult that it's hard to, you know, it's that it's so outside the box, that it's so contrary and there's such a, a, a disposition to rush into the channel that's the familiar channel and to assume the familiar outcome. So I agree with you completely that that's the thing that has to be overcome in order to make progress in this in this stuff. The uh, the part about property again, it's people will own their home. You know, it's not the case that you live someplace and I can walk down the street and say, "Oh shit, I want to go there." So I go into your house, <laughs> and while you're not there, and now it's my house. No, that's nonsense. Okay, and. Uh, if your friends are right, that that is a human disposition, mm -hmm. a human inclination, which mm -hmm. would exist in significant degree, right, in an equitable society in which everybody has, you know, the, the kind of well-being, material well-being that everybody else has. Not exactly the same, because some work more and some work less, but basically the same. If, it, if people would do that, then you'd have to have uh, a job with a balanced job complex that was protecting against that. And if it wasn't that from that common, as I believe it would not be, um, and it was instead more like Hannibal Lecter, in other words, it's somebody who's completely off the charts, mm -hmm. who's behaving that way. Well, you still need to deal with it, and you and you don't deal with it by saying, well, everybody will deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, you don't, that, that's one of the, okay, you asked me earlier if I was an anarchist. One of the things I don't like about that, that some anarchists say, for example, is they'll say, um, well, the reason, I mean, we don't need any enforcement because everybody will do it. You notice they don't say we don't need anybody to fly an airplane because everybody will do it. We'll just get on the airplane and somebody <laughs> will fly it. It's almost right? like a libertarian kind of mode of thinking, right? It, it's not thinking, right? In other words, nobody thinks that you that everybody would get on the airplane, right? Yeah. And and people would raise their hand and say, "Okay, I'll fly it." Right? Mm -hmm. That's absurd. It requires training. It requires experience. It requires skills. And the same is true for dealing with Hannibal Lecter or even dealing with a, a, a sort of a violent misogynist or mm -hmm. dealing with, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If to the extent those things exist, you need a mechanism for dealing with them. Now you don't need the mechanism we currently have, which doesn't, it's not even its purpose. Its purpose is to fuck people over um, mm -hmm. and keep them down. And it does the other stuff only to the extent that it's necessary to rationalize itself. But you would need stuff like that. So, you, so it's not that you don't have experts. Participatory economics doesn't not have experts. It just doesn't, it doesn't say that because you have ec expert knowledge of chemistry or because you have expert knowledge of doing <coughs> operations, brain surgery, or you have expert knowledge of, I don't know, basketball so you can coach, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't it doesn't say that because you have that you deserve income for it. And now somebody will say, well, there's no incentive to have it. And and that's that's an example of what you described at the beginning, which is why I'm, I'm circling back to that. That's an example of people looking at what we have and sort of thinking it's inevitable. If you can get yourself into a situation where you're talking to a room full of college students and you ask them, uh, uh, you ask somebody, you know, raise your hand if you're in pre-med, going to be mm -hmm. a doctor. So they raise their hand. And now you say to them, okay, I want you to tell me something. If, if you, you have the option now of instead of going to college, they're in high school and they're, they're going to go to college. Instead of going to college, you can go straight into the mines or you can go straight into being a short order cook. Or you can go straight into whatever, right? And so instead of suffering, because that's what they tell us. They tell us we have to pay doctors so much because otherwise they wouldn't become doctors. So instead of suffering going to college for four years, mm -hmm. 
instead of suffering going to medical school, and instead of suffering caring for people and saving lives, right, you can flip burgers or go into the coal mine. And to, if you do that, you're going to earn, let's say, $50,000 a year. And if you become the doctor, you're going to earn $500,000 a year. And mm -hmm. now I want to do a little experiment with you. I mm -hmm. want to start lowering your salary. And you tell me when, instead of going to college, medical school, and becoming a doctor, you will instead go straight from high school into the coal mine. 400000 Nobody says yes. 300000 Nobody says yes. 200000 Nobody says yes. And I keep going. And I get to 50000 And every time I've ever done this, Somebody raises their hand and says, um, I don't know how low I can go and survive, but I'm not going into the damn coal mine. <laughs> and what it evidence is, is that, is that what you need an incentive to do is that which is harmful, is that which is not in all, you know, less fulfilling. You need more incentives, the less fulfilling it is. So you need incentive to work longer or to work harder or to work under worse conditions. And that's exactly what participatory economics provides. If we provide incentive for having reflexes like Michael Jordan or having Adele's voice, you know what? I could offer you 500, uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I might be wrong about this, but I could offer you, you know, $50 million and you can't remake yourself to have Adele's voice or to have, you know, Jordan's athletic ability. Mm -hmm. There's no incentive effect at all. It is not as an incentive that people get income for these kinds of things. It's because they have the power to take it. And, it, and it's very I, interesting you say that because as I was, I was, I was walking upstairs, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, okay, I got to do the show. And the conversation wasn't heated at all. It wasn't a, an antagonistic conversation. It was one of those conversations yeah. where, you can see brains turning on everybody's end. And the first thing they thought was like, well, this is kind of where having a UBI is great. And, and, you know, one of the, it's, I'm staying with a husband and a wife and the wife is a, is a, a tattoo artist. And she, uh, she says, when people were getting all that extra money during COVID, I knew people that said, finally, I can do that thing I've been wanting to do. Yeah. And yeah. so and, often when in capitalism, we're told that it is through, you know, only through struggle in capitalism will you do get something great made or done or have some sort of technological advancement. Which but that's, we all know it's, isn't true. Again, it's total nonsense. If you have, suppose you have, uh, uh, suppose we go in the old West, you know how you had land rushes? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You know, for land. So that you all line up and then you rush out and you get your plot of land, right? Okay, so somebody looks at that and says, it's no good. It's not fair. That person has a better horse. This person mm -hmm. has a better wagon. It's not a fair race, right? And this is the usual critique, right? If, if somebody makes a critique, we should make the race fair, right? We should make the competition fair. Well, there's a problem. It doesn't matter whether you make the competition fair or not if the prizes are not fair, right? If somebody gets the big prize and the little prize, it do, in other words, it, the inequality is a function of the of the disparate prizes. It's it, it the the only thing that the competition determines is who gets it, but the outcome is determined by the way you. In, in our case, remunerate. If you remunerate property, if you have, you know, mansions and hovels and you're racing for the mansion and the hovel, um, you still have a mansion and a hovel, right? <laughs> Even if the person who worked harder got the mansion, which of mm -hmm. course doesn't happen in real life. But even if they did, so what? That's not just, you know, that's not good. So, um, I mean, the reality is, almost everything is upside down. You know, we, we live in a society which is so far from any kind of, of humane rationality, much less delivering well-being and dignity and, and fulfillment to people, 
that that almost everything is crazy and we are constantly fed formulations like you have to pay people to become doctors otherwise they won't well in our society people people who have the power to to make demands won't 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 stay there because they they will demand more but it's not because it's bad the people who have the best circumstances also get the highest income right why because they have bargaining power because the bargaining power gives them the income and it also gives them the conditions of work right so people get the best of everything because of bargaining power and they get the worst of everything uh, if they don't have bargaining power as pascal knows as a as a lawyer sometimes we lose some of our best lawyers to corporate law because you know it's hard to survive on a public defender salary sure people used to ask me years back a, a residue of the 60s on people's thinking young people's thinking and they would ask michael i want to go to law school should i and i would say to them and they had in mind that they might be corrupted by it right and i said to them look the fact that you're asking me the question and that you think that you might be corrupted if you really do think that means maybe maybe you can go and not be corrupted by it but if you think that you're above it if you think that you're not going to be a victim to it there's not a chance that you won't you know that you will go to it and retain your desires to be just and to to be concerned about human well-being and so on um it's hard i you know we live in a fucked up world che guevara made a made a choice at one point right he basically said i'm a doctor che was a doctor mm -hmm. right he's a medical doctor so I, in one hand he's got his medical bag and in the other hand he has a rifle now it's not the case that in an ideal future Anybody in their right mind should want a rifle over being able to help people with a medical bag. But what Che said is health care in Cuba is going to be a function of making change. And in Cuba, he felt that required, and maybe it did, right? A, a rifle, not a medical bag. That's what I mean by upside down. I mean, it, it, you know, the whole, the whole situation that everybody faces... I, I have a question for you guys. Um, I have this feeling, and it's purely intuition and maybe anecdotal, mm -hmm. that young people, and I'm no longer young, so I'm asking, that young people, um, particularly high school, college, just out of college, et cetera, um, have to be on a knife edge, a personal knife edge right now between submission and rebellion it just seems like they have to be the 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 evidence of injustice is so visible the evidence that we're on a suicide track is so visible they're seeing it we know that and now what do they do they either submit and just make the best of you know whatever time they have or they decide to fight. And I don't mean, you know, becoming a maniac. I mean, you know, Some becoming sort of involved and, and joining movements. And and I have this feeling that that there's going to be a, uh, a change because of that coming from young people. We saw a little of it with the climate movement, which moved from old timers to young folks. Um, I mean, I think you see a little bit of it in uh, in Pascal's neck of the woods in uh, Parkland, Florida, with the kids that got involved with yeah. the, uh, you know, trying to actually lobby politicians into changing uh, gun laws. Uh, I think those movements get co-opted extremely quick because there's not a lot of elder leadership involved that can point them on a constant right direction. And before you know it, they're, you know, monetizing said quote unquote movement. Yeah. And it becomes a uh, podcast and t-shirt sales. Well, that's on us, right? I, I, I look, I'm not calling you a piece of shit. No, anything, it is on us, OG, it, but it, it is on us. Look, right? 
let's let's be real before we go to the paywall. <laughs> let's, let's let's keep it very real before we go to the paywall here. There's not a lot of OGs left that are still trying to really get involved because a lot of OGs got government jobs and and uh, and got into academia. What's an OG? OGs is an, is an urban colloquialism for original gangsters. It means an old schooler, somebody who's from back in the day, like someone from the new left in the 60s. Yeah, you're, you're an OG. Involved. You're a fish. Right, so I'm not. Okay. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to be an OG. Okay. Uh, I'll take that. But but look, there is there is a sense in which, I mean, when I look over my life, so to speak, mm-hmm. we did a lot in the 60s. Um, we shook things up a lot. We had a lot of effect on people's beliefs on on thought systems uh and some of it persisted but what we did not do is form sustained movements right the leadership you're talking about sustained movements which continually sought more which didn't give up and didn't uh compromise the the long-term aspirations and look i have to face reality we did what we did 50, 55 years ago, and we had Trump, right? And mm-hmm. we had, you know, obviously that's not a model, right? We don't want to be active and political now and form movements now and 50 years from now, if we ever even get there, right, have the likes of Trump again. So something has to be different. And I think one of the things that has to be different is there has to be clear, shared, communicable vision. And then there has to be clear, shared, communicable strategy. And there has to be a humbleness that allows continual reevaluation. And with those characteristics, maybe we can, maybe you and people now can do better than my generation did. Um, I mean, ultimately, we all try and uh, you said something before we went on. And uh, and I want to repeat what you said. You said, I'm tired of losing. I want to win. <laughs> uh, and, and, and you said it like that with that level of enthusiasm. So uh, it's one thing to do shows about critique. We do a lot of we do enough of those, but we need to have more shows about winning and what it looks like when we win. His name is Michael Albert. We'll be talking to him more on the bonus half. We went over four whole minutes. That's four free minutes. I'm lying on myself when I said the game is to be sold, not to be told. Pascal Robert, do you have the closing remarks before I I get us out of here with some chill music? I want to thank you, uh, Michael, for coming on our show to explain the basis of your book, Uh, No Bosses and Participatory Economy. I uh, I have lots of questions. I find it fascinating. Um, it, to me, it's about the praxis and how we go from theory to reality. And uh, all of this, humbly, capitalism, so these things are not physics. They are not mm-hmm. like rainwater. They are socialization of behavior and structures created by elites to benefit them. And the capacity to have alternatives to these structures, for me, lies in the ability to socialize people to a different ideological vision that at least meets their needs and allows them to live with a basic level of material uh, security, comfort, and reality. So the process of how we get from here to there is always what I'm really interested in. So if you guys want to hear what Pascal is going to ask. Can I give a plug? Hell yeah. And we were, we were posting up your site, but yeah, go ahead, plug it up. Um, well, I do a podcast called Revolution Z. And if you were interested in and liked and were moved by any of the stuff that we said today, uh, check out that podcast. And you can find the links, et cetera, on Znet or, you know, Google or whatever zcom.org backslash revolution z it's on the Uh, screen there should be links in the description wherever you're watching this show thank you guys for joining us and if you're a patron get ready for the patron bonus half as i will be off the screen most of the time because i took up pascal's airtime that's why he's making that face at me now (laughs) 
You, you guys will. are very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>